All right, well, first, thanks for having me here, Pete. It was a great pleasure, Patrick. I'm, I'm glad you were able to come and do this. Me too, me too. All right, <clears throat> what is the fascinating truth about taxation in America? The, the fascinating truth is that taxation in America is properly limited in its objects as intended by the founders and it, consistent with the structure that they incorporated into the Constitution. It only applies to a limited range of American earners, uh, those who benefit from the exercise of a federal prerogative. And it, as such, it does not touch private sector Americans in any direct fashion whatsoever. Now what you're saying, uh, let me get this straight, is that for most private sector Americans, their earnings do not constitute taxable income? That's correct. Uh, in fact, it should not be qualified in the fashion that you qualified it. It isn't for most. Any and all earnings which are exclusively private in their provenance are not touched by federal taxation. And yet, most Americans year after year, uh, decade after decade of their working lives, pay income taxes. It's true. The, the fact is, the system by which income taxes uh, are administered makes use of, and exploits even, a widespread ignorance on the part of the American public as to the nature of the legal structure uh, by which the taxes are implemented, and in fact an ignorance of general legal principles uh, as a whole. Uh, consequently, they do not recognize the use of custom legal terms within the law. They do not recognize the fact that the uh, information mechanisms that are associated with the tax constitute uh, legal instruments that they themselves execute legal instruments when they are uh, doing what they imagine is necessary to comply with tax law. They are having the wool pulled over their eyes in a very systematic and institutional fashion. Okay, you're talking about custom legal terms. Uh, what are some of those custom legal terms that uh, a lot of Americans uh, are, let's say, uh, fooled with or ignorant about? Mis misled about? Uh, the most significant uh, would be employee, the meaning of uh, employee being a, a custom legal term with a, with a unique definition within the revenue law, which is completely different from its definition in uh, common usage or the definition of the word that is a homonym of that legal term. Wages is another very significant uh, uh, custom defined legal term within the revenue law. does not mean earnings or the pay from labor as we uh, use the, the uh, word that is its homonym in common usage. Uh, it, it, in fact, uh, that, that term, wages, is exclusively defined in the law as the remuneration paid to federal workers and office holders and the workers and office holders uh, of federal agencies and instrumentalities and federally controlled corporations. Uh, trade or business, another custom legal term with a unique meaning that does not mean uh, uh, a, 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 a business person, an entrepreneur, uh, the owner of a gas station, the owner of a grocery store. It, it means the, uh, someone who engages in the performance of the functions of a public office. That's the literal definition within the law of trade or business. That is the only definition within the law of trade or business. Any reference to a trade or business within the revenue law means nothing but the performance of the functions of a public office. So when someone is charged with a legal responsibility or a legal obligation in association with their trade or business activities, that obligation, that responsibility, extends no further than the, 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 their activity in performing the functions of a public office. It does not extend to their activity engaged in any private sector behavior or any private sector business, any private sector endeavor. How is it that um, most Americans wind up um, uh, using these homonyms in order to create the presumption of a tax liability with the IRS? Because the only time they are shown these terms, it is out of context. It is without the provision of the definitions that inform these terms. They are simply presented, for instance, by their accountant, by the, an IRS agent that they encounter, uh, 
by uh, tax attorneys, uh, by their fellow citizens. Uh, they are presented with the commands associated with the law in which these terms are deployed, but without being presented with the definitions of these terms. In fact, without being presented with anything to suggest to their mind that there are custom definitions associated with these terms. They take it for granted because they are not told. When they are told, if you're an employee, you must do this thing or that thing, not, not being told that, and by the way, an employee means this definition, which is provided in the law, they take it for granted that the word, that the term actually is the common word. And so they are being told that if you work for somebody else, which is the general meaning of the common word, employee, then you must do these things. No question is asked, consequently. Uh, if, if, if the definition were provided, or even if there were notification that there is a definition to be, to be uh, looked up, to be uh, sought after, all would be different. But they're not provided with that. They're simply shown the commands. They're presented with excerpts of the law and consequently are misled. If what you're saying is true, then trillions of dollars uh, per year from the American economy are being sucked out of the private sector into the public sector that should not be? Absolutely, should not be. In fact, the Founding Fathers, when they structured the Constitution, deliberately intended that access to funding on the part of the federal government should be a difficult and highly politically accountable process. They provided mechanisms for the federal government to fund itself, and there is nothing within those mechanisms that inherently limits the amount of funding available to the federal government. Uh, one of those methods, for instance, is a standard direct tax. It is a, the type, a type of tax that the federal government exercised a number of times uh, uh, during the first 120 years or so of our history. Uh, this is a mechanism by which the, the uh, government identifies objects upon which the tax will be laid, identifies a tax rate, multiplies the number of objects within the country to which that rate will apply by the rate itself and ends up with a figure and then distributes the obligation or the liability for that amount among the various states by, mecha by a mechanism known as apportionment in which the total amount is divided uh, amongst the states in a, on the basis of their percentage of the population so that a state that, uh, that possessed 10% of the population of the country as a whole would pay 10% of the total tax. A state that possessed 17% of the population of the country would pay 17% of the tax. The federal government is, is at liberty at any time to deploy that kind of tax, fully constitutional tax. At the moment, the federal government spends about $2.3 trillion a year. Any time Congress cared to institute a direct tax, it could go before the American people and say, we need $2.3 trillion this year to finance our activities. Uh, this is what we're going to spend the money on. Uh, and here's our voice vote in favor of this tax, and could raise every penny of that amount. Theoretically, we're the majority of us are agreeing to the 2.3 trillion dollars in expenditures. Otherwise, it would be illegal. It would be uh, uh, illegitimate. So there should be no problem uh, accomplishing this this goal. But it obviously involves a great deal of political accountability. That's a whole different political animal, a whole different political scene from the current situation in which. The income tax represents an open spigot pouring money into the treasury at all times with no voting whatsoever involved. Occasionally there will be a vote to, uh, to institute some modest reform or another or raise the tax rates. Occasionally there will be a, 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 a drop in the tax rates, but interestingly, very rarely is there any overall diminishment of the tax as a total going into Washington. But there is no political accountability in that system. Uh, there is no uh, necessity to ask for the money. In a constitutional direct tax, Congress does indeed have to ask for the money and, and vote for it. Uh, each direct tax is a one-time affair. It is not an ongoing, open-ended, once we've, once we've taken this political risk one time, we don't ever have to do it again, we can just keep spending the money. Uh, a whole different 
uh, dynamic and, and the dynamic that the founders intended. So then, uh, according to this apportionment rule that's in the uh, Constitution, there's no way then that the federal government could come directly to me, a private citizen, and say it needs or that I owe it this amount of dollars. That's absolutely correct, um, for several reasons. Uh, for one thing, the federal government can't command by right anything that isn't its own property. Uh, and and uh, obviously your property is not its property, and so it cannot claim a, a portion of it uh, just as a matter of, of an exercise of its own authority. Uh, for another, technically the federal government is not, it doesn't have any direct linkage to you anyway. It is, a, it is a creation of the state governments. It is an agent of the state governments. That's one of the reasons why even an apportioned direct tax, the, the, the sole form of direct taxation that is permitted under the Constitution, it isn't the individual's amongst the states who pay the tax. It is the states that are liable for the tax. The tax is imposed on the states. Now it may well be, and in fact would be the case, that the states would get the money that they pay that tax with from their citizens. So ultimately, in one fashion or another, maybe perhaps not uh, in a, in a, uh, uh, a direct one-on-one -on -one fashion, citizens are the ones who are going to pay that tax, but it is technically the states themselves that are liable for it. So if the federal government uh, did pass a direct apportion tax, the states then become the collectors of that tax? The states become the remitters of that tax. They're the, the entities that are liable for it to the federal government, and they collect it in whatever fashion they care to, whatever fashion suits their own constitutional limitations. In some states, that would mean that the state governments themselves might impose a direct tax on, on their citizenry and collect the money that way. Other states that, that may have limitations on direct taxation within their own constitutional structures would have to uh, act in accordance with those constitutional limitations, whatever they may be. The other uh, area then that the Constitution specifically mentions taxation is with this term excise tax. And excise tax is a term that a lot of Americans may have heard in their history class, uh, like tariff, but it doesn't really seem to have any uh, it's not a word that floats around in our daily, everyday life. Uh, what is the relation of the excise tax to well, the federal government and the people? Well, first, it's worth, worthwhile to, to recognize what an excise tax is. Excise means a piece of the action. That's the, that's, that's, that's the meaning of the term, and it, 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 that fully illustrates the kind of tax it is. The reality is a federal government, like any other government, like any other entity, is entitled, as a matter of right, to a piece of the action of anything that it directly facilitates that involves the, the, the exercise of its own powers that involves the use of its own property. The federal government is, for lack of a better term, a corporate entity, and I don't mean that in the sense of that it's just like General Motors or it's just like IBM, but it is a corporealization of the polity. It is, a, it is the agent of the states and by extension an agent of the people and it has a legal personhood. Uh, as such, it, it owns things. It owns things and it has rights. It has specific powers. We delegated to that government a number of specific powers in much the same fashion that, uh, you know, you might imagine a family uh, has a child that, that has come up and, and uh, come into their majority and, uh, the, and the, 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 the mother and father might decide that, that they're going to uh, uh, they're going to give that child uh, uh, some land so that that child can uh, have a means of providing for himself or herself. Uh, so they give them the back 40 and, and now that's that child's property and it can work that land and use that land and provide for, for himself uh, with that land. In much the same fashion we gave we give our governments, we gave our state governments, and, and by extension we gave our federal government certain areas of authority that are its, within its power to, to, to administer and from which it can finance itself. Uh, anything that involves the use of that property, anything that involves the use of those powers, that government can claim an, an interest in as a matter of right. And if that use is profitable, it can claim a portion of those profits, and does. That's an excise. It does it by way of an excise tax. The income tax 
is an excise tax. It is an excise on the exercise of a federal prerogative measured by the dollars that are produced through that exercise. The tax is not on the dollars themselves. It's on the activity that produces the dollars, and it's measured by the dollars. The amount of activity that was engaged in is measured by the dollars that are produced. So the only, uh, if I were to, um, truthfully, according to what you're saying, if, if I'm on a, a 10 for, if I'm filing my tax return this year, the only uh, thing I need to report as income to them is any monies that I may have uh, gained as a result of a connection with the powers or privilege of working with the federal government. That's correct. Not speaking of you personally, right. but in general, any individual. How is it possible that this information has remained hidden or obstructed from view for so long? It would seem uh, that it's so obvious in terms of the way that the Constitution is written. Where did the, uh, where did the error come from? The tax code, which is the the tax code is the is the uh, expression of the relevant laws that are m that is most accessible to uh, most people who would seek to know the meaning of those laws, and the tax code itself is better than four million words in size. Uh, in fact, it's it's about four and a half million words in in length. Even at that. It is a condensation of the actual statutes that that code is a mere reflection of. The code, for the most part, is itself not actually the law. It is a compilation, a condensation of the law. It is a, a, a prima facie evidence of the existing law, it, which, which was created in order to make uh, uh, access to the law simpler. Um, and Believe me, it actually does. Even at four and a half million words, it is simpler to access information by way of the code than it is by way of the laws, uh, which represent a series of enactments roughly every two years that's been going on since 1861. Uh, but because of that, the dimensions of the compilation and the even larger dimensions of the law that it reflects, uh, digging into that body of work is difficult. Uh, it is no surprise whatsoever to me that until the time came that the code first and, and to uh, a lesser degree the laws that the code reflects became digitized, it was virtually impossible for anyone to do a truly meaningful uh, analysis and mining of the content of those laws. But when the time came that they did become digitized, it became possible to, in a matter of, of moments, uh, search through that entire four and a half million words of code. And as the laws have become digitized, um, uh, the, the same has been available in regard to the actual laws themselves. That's what made the difference. And that's why Ignorance has reigned for um, several generations now. Uh, the other side of the coin is that the creation of this structure of statutes took place over the course of several generations. It began in the 1860s. It uh, has proceeded ever since. It has done it in, in small incremental changes. Uh, the adoption of any dramatic components of that structure has tended to take place during times of crisis when the uh, attention of the country as a whole was elsewhere. Uh, the, much of the change took place during the Depression. Well, the initial, the initial enactments took place during the Civil War. Uh, a great deal of the, of the remainder took place during the Depression and some during World War II. Uh, all periods at which several things were going on, several dynamics were in play. One, people were considerably distracted uh, by the external events to the level of uh, nationalism tended to run high in all of those times and consequently the inclination of people as a whole uh, 
to look closely at enactments of what was, in fact, their own government, uh, a popularly, pop, popularly elected government, uh, uh, doing what uh, they imagined were uh, what, act, enactments in their own interest. Uh, their tendency to look uh, closely at, at those enactments was smaller than normal. Uh, uh, voices that may have been uh, d dissenting voices uh, tend to be heard least uh, clearly during times of national crisis. And uh, so by uh, uh, small increments, uh, this structure was constructed and the, the ignorance of uh, born of time, um, an ignorance born of very careful uh, uh, construction, an ignorance born of uh, enormous complexity, all combined to uh, make and keep hidden the actual character of the law. But it would be safe to say that there's always been a section of the American population that has known the truth that you discovered. No, that's actually not safe to say, I don't believe. Uh, if 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 anyone has uh, some legislative draftsman, perhaps in uh, in Congress, it's possible that the that the uh, true nature of this tax has has been understood at that level. Certainly, uh, a number of legislative uh, drafts people that have gone on record on this subject have made clear that they have understood elements of it. Whether they had a, a handle on the entire uh, subject is is impossible to determine. Um, however. I will say that in, in having read an enormous portion of the law and the codification of the law and the regulations that are associated with much of, of uh, those statutes, uh, I have yet to see a single instance of an error made in misusing one of the custom legal terms that we've discussed, uh, wages, employee, employer, trader business, self-employment, uh, etc. Uh, I've, I've not once seen one of those terms uh, inadvertently or, or erroneously replaced by a uh, common term. Common terms do find their way, common uh, synonyms of these terms do find their way into the uh, regulatory constructions, especially occasionally, uh, only when the, when the overall context has already been established by the use of the key terms, but I've never yet seen a mistake made where earnings was substituted for wages, for instance, when it would violate the technical accuracy of the portion in question. Uh, so somebody, somebody perhaps knows. Somebody at that level is making sure that no mistakes are made and that the law doesn't attempt to claim an authority that it does not have. That's one of the um, interesting things about your understanding of the tax code that you outline in your book as opposed to other, um, let's say, people who say that they've cracked the IRS code and all this. There's lots of ideas floating around out there um, about why the income tax is unconstitutional and all of these other sorts of things. You're saying the income tax is constitutional. It's entirely constitutional. And the 16th Amendment did not create the income tax, is that correct? No, absolutely not. The 16th Amendment was, in fact, a, a, just a minor loophole closure. Uh, not minor if one is a, is, is a uh, uh, robber baron type uh, who lives on, uh, on clipping coupons uh, or in connection with federal investments. But to most of America, it was a completely insignificant, uh, in fact, a meaningless change. The, the purpose of the 16th Amendment was to close a loophole opened by the Supreme Court in Pollock versus Farmers Loan and Trust in which, the, uh, in which Pollock argued, he was, a, he was a, uh, a stockholder in Farmers Loan and Trust, an organization which was both a bank and a, a company that had made investments in railroading. Uh, railroads are federal instrumentalities and had been ruled as such by the Supreme Court a few years prior to the Pollock case uh, coming to the docket, and when Farmers Loan and Trust was going to pay dividends to stockholders, uh, 
it elected to abide by the Income Tax Act of 1894, which called upon it to uh, pay a tax on, on those dividends, or to pay a tax on its own profits uh, prior to distributing dividends. Pollock argued that to impose a tax on the dividends from stock amounted to a tax on the stock itself. He said that a tax on the fruit is a tax on the tree. And so despite the fact that the dividends were received in connection with the exercise of a federal prerogative, which is to say a partial ownership in a federal corporation or a federal instrumentality in the, in the form of, uh, of uh, the railroads that Farmers Loan and Trust was invested in, and perhaps Farmers Loan and Trust itself, I don't recall right offhand now whether it constituted a national bank at that time, although today it is Citibank. Uh, Farmers Loan and Trust has changed its name a number of times over the years. Uh, but uh, Citibank started out as Farmers Loan and Trust. Uh, so he argued that even though those dividends might constitute income or would in fact constitute income taken by themselves, because a tax on them constituted a tax on the stock, which is personal property, that kind of tax was unconstitutional unless it was imposed by the apportionment rule. In other words, it was a direct tax on him. It's a tax on his personal property that makes it a direct tax on him it has to be apportioned. The Supreme Court agreed and said that because of that connection, because of the linkage between the receipt and its source, the dividend and the stock, that tax was illegitimate. And it struck down 10 sections of the Income Tax Act of 1894, which was only a tiny portion of that tax act. But in any case, it was the, it was the key uh, portion of the, of the act that applied to this, this area. The 16th Amendment says Congress can tax income without regard to the source, without a resort to the source at all and without apportionment. So the 16th Amendment is simply a, a loophole closure. It is closing that loophole that the Pollock Court opened up and saying that even though the receipt realized is connected with personal property, it can be taxed without regard to that personal property connection. Because and, it's connected to uh, federal privilege or power. That's correct. The, the, the tax, even under the 16th Amendment, can only apply to income, income being the exercise of a federal prerogative, but, the, but it cannot be thwarted. That, the application of that tax to that income cannot be thwarted by a resort to the source argument that Pollock had made by saying that a tax on the fruit is a tax on the tree. 16th Amendment says a tax on the fruit is not to be considered a tax on the tree. It's as simple as that. So the, the source and the receipt is, is separated. So why does the uh, 16th Amendment get so much play in American history books throughout our country? Because the wording of the, of the 16th Amendment, without understanding that income does not mean all that comes in, the 16th Amendment, read in ignorance of that distinction, appears to empower Congress to tax everything, to tax any money, any earnings that any American receives. That's how it sounds, if read in isolation and without understanding the, the, the limiting meaning of the term income. However, as the Supreme Court itself pointed out, as soon as the first income tax enactment after the passage of the 16th Amendment was tested in Brueschaper versus Union Pacific Railroad, that is not an, a, an appropriate understanding of the situation. In fact, it can't be an appropriate understanding of the situation or a legitimate understanding of the situation because the 16th Amendment in no way repealed, modified, or otherwise compromised the other provisions of the Constitution which prohibit a direct tax. And so it is a misunderstanding to suggest that the 16th somehow did away with the limitations on a direct tax that, had, that the Constitution contains Actually, is the, the Constitution contains in two places. It's the only thing, in the, the only prohibition on government power in the Constitution that is mentioned twice, uh, that, that limitation on direct taxation. But the 16th, again, read in isolation without an understanding of the limited meaning of income. And in fact, uh, informed by a vigorous, diligent, relentless, 
lifelong campaign on the part of the beneficiaries of misunderstanding to lead us all to imagine that the term income means all that comes in. The 16th sounds as though it authorizes this broad-based tax uh, on all earnings. In fact, what it sounds, what it's made to sound like is as though it authorizes a capitation. So it's kind of ironic, isn't it, that a, uh, a history book which is taught in schools, which is dedicated to the elimination of ignorance, is actually fostering one of the most costliest pieces of ignorance in American history. Haven't history books always been occasionally guilty of this? <laughs>